details from the mall in a minute. But first, some of your comments about the Yes to Independence campaign. Bradley Booth says it's more than likely the Yes campaign will work. Time people realise Westminster's tactics are just trying to scare them. George Laird said, I don't think the Yes campaign will convince the public. As an SNP member, the party hasn't done enough and the Scottish government isn't ready either. And Berkey says, to convince me, they'll need to explain implications on health care, education, armed forces and UK debt rather than just trying the freedom vote. Thanks very much indeed for your comments. They've become a centre point of our society and with 31 across Scotland are increasingly popular. But what's the continued appeal of the shopping mall? A new book of anecdotes and confessions from these consumerist temples is out now by Scottish author Ewan Morrison. I'll chat to him shortly, but first he explains how these retail spaces try to keep us hooked. For the last three years I've been walking around the shopping malls of Northern England and Scotland asking awkward questions like, are shopping malls good for us as a culture? And finding out people's stories, people at work and shop in malls. I've been asking, is there in fact a subtle science of consumer manipulation at work every time we step into one of these places? Why is it that the up and down escalators are situated so far apart? In fact, if I want to get from the up to the down, I'm going to have to walk between about five to six different retail shops. Well, that's the reason why. Because in passing these places, there's about a 4% chance that I might get distracted in the simple movement from up to down and actually buy something else. This notion of deliberately manipulating people's movement in a shopping mall is called corralling, and it was first designed for the manipulation of farm animals. Why are food courts and toilets so often placed on the top floor of new shopping malls? It would be so much easier if they were just down there at the front door. Well, this is exactly why mall food courts and toilets are placed so far away from the main doors. It's all about getting you to stay here longer. There is, in fact, a 14% chance after you've eaten in a top floor mall food court, you will spend another hour here. And since you're on the top floor already, the only way is down past all of those other shops. So shopping malls manipulate us as consumers, but they also manipulate town spaces, regional spaces. In America, we've seen shopping malls put entire towns out of business as all of the retail flows towards the mall and leaves little towns stranded. In the UK, it's not quite as bad as that. We've seen mall regeneration. Shopping malls like Buchanan Galleries here being used to rejuvenate a city centre. So we have to ask ourselves, malls, are they good? Are they bad? And do we want the world to continue to be mauled? And Ewan is with me now in the studio. Ewan, can you answer your own question? Are they good or are they bad? <laughs> well, I wish I could, but it would seem like a kind of polemic or politic if I, was, if I was to say I'm against shopping malls or I'm for them and part of the, the kind of purpose behind the book was to just f ask sort of broader simpler dumber questions like how do they work what sort of structures are they architecturally who pays for them who builds them what's it like to work inside them you know are there things that they do to us that we don't realize um, and it was really kind of human question really you know what what's the human impact of these places so that was why I ended up talking to so many mall staff and finding out I mean the sort of inner psychology um, of the shopping mall, rather than answering the big question. Your book is called Tales from the Mall. Tell, tell us a tale. All, is, all of life is there. Indeed, and some quite extreme life is there. Um, through the process of going around and asking mall staff, uh, I got a great story in Glasgow from a, from a security guard who told me about a, uh, a cleaner who was a racist cleaner. Very, she was from a tough working class background and didn't like Asian people. And uh, she was cleaning up on the top floor of the fifth car park the fifth floor car park in fact and um, there was an Asian man who was about to jump uh, this was a shopping mall in which they have four suicide attempts a year so she went up to him hurled some abuse at him and he got down off the wall confronted her she pinned him to the ground 
and then the, the uh, security people arrived and uh, they told her that she'd done everything perfectly for what you're supposed to do because you're supposed to provoke people who are suicides and let them know there's consequences to their actions and pin them down basically. So she'd unwittingly done exactly what she was supposed to do, and, fantastic. And he was very yeah. grateful, he was very grateful to that. It, shopping malls are the same the world over, you say, but is the behaviour within them the same the world over? Well, you know, we all wear Nikes now the world over and we all wear Gap. Um, and chinos and things like that. Um, there are some strange behaviours which are not part of consumerism which come with shopping malls. For example, there's, there's a, an interesting thing that started happening in Scotland which is uh, mall walking, which is imported from America. It's basically old people keep fit by walking around malls in circles. Um, so that's one thing that was, that was never really part of the retail plan. They never buy anything and people get, re uh, the, the mall owners get really annoyed with them in America because they take up the best parking spaces in the morning. They walk very, very fast and, <laughs> Clogging up the and bump into people. There's other strange things as well, like there's the international growth of, uh, sort of transvestites who use shopping malls because you can park your car, buy some women's clothing, try it on in the toilet or the car park, change back again, get into your car and drive away. Did you come across any? I, I, two cases in Glasgow. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So what made you get into them then? Mm. I think it was something to do with growing up in Wick in the Highlands, um, which is a place without a mall. Uh, and all of a sudden in the uh, late 80s, a uh, huge mall appeared in Inverness. And all of a sudden, people started driving for three hours through the Highlands um, to go and shop in the mall. You know, and they would come back and they would have smarter clothes than the rest of us. So then it sort of created a mass exodus where everyone then had to drive for three hours to go to the shopping mall. You and very briefly, do you like shopping? Uh, as a man, I, I'm probably very typical in this. Uh, I think as soon as they get like man crushes in malls. Everyone likes shoe shopping. I can't believe you didn't. You can't <laughs> believe that. Anyway, you and Morrison, thanks so much indeed for Thank joining you. us in Scotland tonight. Cheers. Before we go tonight, let's take a quick look at five things happening tomorrow. As we discussed earlier, the Yes to Independence campaign will be launched in Edinburgh. Justice Secretary Kenny McCaskill is to address the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents annual conference. Further afield, the first commercial space flight, SpaceX, is due to dock with the International Space Station. Scottish singer-songwriter Eddie Reader is playing the headline gig at the Montrose Music Festival. And a host of old firm legends will tee off in the first Tommy Burns Masters Golf Tournament to raise money for the late Celtic Stars Skin Cancer Trust. Well, that's all from Scotland tonight. John will be back on Monday. Until then, on the day a Chinese toddler was captured by a CCTV camera riding through rush hour traffic on his toy scooter and later saved by a policeman. Here's one last thing.